Hey there, Interwebs, and once again, welcome back to Russell's Guide to Monsters. I'll be honest, I wasn't planning on releasing another installment so soon after the last episode, but if life has taught me anything, it's that reality is rather rude and often fails to take my plans into consideration before it unfolds. Thus, here we are. With last month's video still relatively fresh in your mind then, you may recall that there are those who inaccurately state that snakes are just tails with faces, and that's exactly what we're going to focus on today. Serpent-headed tails. Cards on the table, I have strong feelings on the concept. Extra heads where they ought not to be, such as with the Anguipedal Giants, Anguibrachial yuan T, and Angui... uh, Tonsorial Gorgons, is one of those classical fantasy monster design features that I find myself wavering back and forth on whether I like or not. Yes, much like Kuatlaque herself, I'm of two minds on the matter. On the one head, er, hand, it makes zero anatomical sense, but on the other, that's also part of its charm. We live in a world which has become increasingly obsessed with realism, to the point that we've created a whole subgenre called realistic fantasy for more plausible takes on the concept. I reject this term because it carries the connotation that in order to be believable, fantasy must be close to reality, which is wholly antithetical to the basic concept. Therefore, something which takes the brakes off and isn't afraid to be a little whimsical or grotesque is a welcome change of pace, or rather, a return to an older, pre-realism pace. One of the most well-known monsters to feature a serpentine tail is the original Chimera of Greek mythology, but the concept in its purest form is simply a double-headed serpent. The double-headed serpent is also the common name for an Aztec sculpture, which is currently in the custody of the British Museum. The entity which it depicts may have some unknown mythological significance, but the creature which is most notable for its snake-headed tail, or rather, the creature whose most notable feature is its snake-headed tail, is the Amphisbina. Its name literally means I go both ways because it has a head at both ends. Unfortunately, I can't tell you more about its anatomy than that because its physiology varies a whole awful lot between tellings, almost as much as the Chimera, ironically. According to Greek mythology, the Amphisbina was originally formed when Perseus flew over the Libyan desert carrying Medusa's severed head, and the blood which dripped onto the sand magically transformed into serpentine monsters, which would make sense because, you know, Medusa head. In the earliest descriptions from classical sources, such as Solanus Claudius Aelianus and Pliny the Elder, these creatures were just two-headed venomous snakes, but by the medieval era they were being depicted with more and more dragon-like features, such as canine heads, legs, and even wings. This 15th century carving from St. Mary's Church in Buckinghamshire shows an amphisbina as a dog or boar-like quadruped, whereas this 12th century image from the Aberdeen Bestiary makes it more draconic or wyvern-like, with a longer, more gracile neck and tail, and replaces one pair of legs with wings. The heraldic creatures known in Blazon as basilisks also have this general morphology, as does the amphisbina in the coat of arms of the Polish Gmina Zapolis, but the heraldic amphisbina used in modern reenactment combines all of these features into a winged, two-headed quadruped. Given how varied depictions of the amphisbina can be, could we say that the chimera is one? I would argue no. Despite some variations of each creature having legs, sometimes wings, and a snake-headed tail, this is mostly overlap in artistic interpretation. Not every Venn diagram is a circle, if you see what I mean. Let's also not forget that the OG Chimera had a fire-breathing goat head on her back as well, while the contemporary Amphisbina was just a two-headed snake. To be honest, the Greek Chimera had more in common with the Persian Manticore, such as the Leonine body in addition to the venomous tail. Meanwhile, in Japan, the Yokai known as the Nue combines aspects of both the Chimera and the Manticore. It has a primate's face, in this case a macaque, the pantherine body and legs of a tiger, and a serpent-headed tail. Horus, Seneca, and Euphorion of Chalkis all said that Kerberos also had a snake for a tail, and a mane of serpents, as well as the multiple canine heads that modern audiences associate with him. Speaking of manes of serpents, I previously described a lion with one as a leonine gorgon, or leogorgon, but I have since discovered that leogorgon is actually a genus of large-bodied therapsids from the late Permian era. The genus is named not for lions, however, but for the acclaimed paleontologist Leonid Tatarinov, and the gorgon half of their name comes from the ancient Greek word gorgos, meaning grim, terrifying, or dreadful. I have also since learned that Dungeons & Dragons has a similar creature called a kamadon, which is essentially a leopard with a mane of serpents from the jungles of Chult. This charming lady, meanwhile, is the mascot for the Etsy shop Underworld and Beyond, and she combines the serpentine hair, scaly body, and supernatural eyes of gorgons with horns and a tail, which are traditionally devil features, giving her a unique demon look. Much like Kerberos, her hair and her tail are also snake-headed, but I think it works. It probably won't surprise you, dear viewer, to learn that I frequently encounter fascinating depictions of fantastic animals in my online wanderings. When I first encountered this image from the Hunterian Psalter, I assumed it was yet another attempt to show the mythical Amphisbina, but I soon learned that it was actually an attempt to show a crab, specifically the star sign Cancer. 
This image from the Ruined Book of Hours, similarly, is meant to represent Scorpio, which brings us to scorpions, another creature with a venomous snake for a tail. Okay, not literally, but bear with me for a moment. If an ancient natural historian like Pliny the Elder described one as a spider with a snake for a tail, he'd be strangely accurate. After all, both spiders and scorpions are arachnids, and the latter has an elongated venom-injecting caudal appendage. And before anyone complains about the size difference, here's a member of the largest known scorpion species, Heterometra swammerdami, aka the giant forest scorpion, and here's an illegally small snack for comparison. And also a palate cleanse. Scorpions are also a bit like snakes in that there are two primary types, and neither has a very good reputation with most humans. You've got the squeezy kind and the venomous kind. One kills you from the outside, and the other kills you from the inside. As a general rule of thumb, and please do not bet your life on it, don't even bet a thumb on it, the larger the claws, the milder the venom. This is because scorpions are a lot like republicans. The ones with the tiniest baby hands need to spew the most toxic vitriol to make up for it. Alternatively, the ones with the powerful venom don't also need massive, resource-consuming pincers to subdue their prey. Snakes are the same way. The beefiest boids, or squeeze noodles as they are officially known, by me, are non-venomous, and the venomous ones didn't evolve to be constrictors. It's a bit of a chicken and the egg situation, although if you find a chicken egg being incubated by a snake, don't hesitate to yeet it over the roof before it can hatch into a cockatrice. Spider snake also sounds like the stoner name for a centipede, in my humble opinion. In fact, without foreknowledge of centipedes to call upon, I'd probably describe one as exactly that. Like a spider, it's a leggy arthropod, but it has a long, flexible body like a snake, and like both, it has a venomous foreend. Technically, only snakes have fangs, spiders have chelicerae, and centipedes have forcipules, but it's simpler to call them all fangs, since you don't want to get bit by any of them. While the scorpion can be thought of as a spider with a snake for a tail, the spider-tailed horned viper is just the opposite. As its name implies, it's a snake with a spider for a tail, or at least a tail which is pretending to be a spider. This example of aggressive mimicry is known as caudal loring and exists because the snake preys on birds, which themselves prey on spiders. If, like Jim Stafford, you don't personally like spiders or snakes, well then you're shit out of luck, bud. If you somehow combined a naga, i.e. a snake person, with a drider, i.e. a spider person, would you get a spider-tailed viper naga, a scorpion centaur, or perhaps a centa person? Artists seem to have a fondness for half-human chimeras using venomous animals. I've seen characters which are spiders, scorpions, centipedes, snakes, and even amphisbini from the waist down, and they're frequently sexy ladies too, thinking about it. You got something you want to say about the fairer sex there, artists? Returning to snakes and scorpion tails, I once had the idea for a homebrew monster in my D&D campaign, which is essentially a snake with a scorpion stinger, making it venomous at both ends without having to add a second head. There's already a canonical monster with the slightly underwhelming name Puffer, which is essentially a crocodilian with a scorpion tail, making it another bestingered reptile. I figure that if a rattlesnake can have a maraca for an ass, shake that booty, why can't mine have a stinger? I'm also not the only person to have had this idea, as an identical creature can be seen in the Donghua series Heaven Official's Blessing, and roughly two and a half thousand years ago, Sun Tzu made mention of the Shuai Jian in his enduring treatise The Art of War. This creature is said to be a snake living in the Shang Mountains, which can attack with either its head or its tail. Unfortunately, he gave no further description of its physiology, so we can't be sure if it had a second head like the Amphisbina, a stinger like a scorpion, or something else entirely. The cartoon Jake Long, American Dragon, adds the legs and claws of a scorpion to this design to create the Krylock demon, and various artists of the internet have explored similar designs. Dark Souls gave us Chaos Witch Quelag, a woman with a spider for a bum, but Dark Souls 2 gave us Scorpion S. Najka, a woman with a scorpion for a bum, and keeping with the theme of twos, she's got two tails, like Pepe the Arizona Bark Scorpion. In heraldry, she would be blazoned as a scorpion double cued, or coup fourche. DS2 also gave us the Duke's Dear Freya, a spider with another spider for a bum, forming a two-headed spider, like an arachnid amphisbina. Perhaps the strangest amphisbina I've ever seen, and one which reminds me of Najka, comes from the Castlevania video game series, where it is also known as the Diplocephalus, meaning two-headed one. Here, it resembles a sort of crocodilian monster with a serpentine tail terminating in what appears to be a woman from the waist up. Honestly, I'm not sure if this maiden head, hehe, <laughs> is supposed to be fully sapient, just an attractive lore which has evolved to resemble a sexy lady, or something somewhere in between, but it makes me think of those dark fantasy interpretations of mermaids which are actually anthropophagic anglerfish. Hey, new band name. Without a doubt, the most disturbing amphisbina I've ever encountered is Wilbur Watley from H.P. Lovecraft's novella The Dunwich Horror. Uh, spoiler alert. It's not exactly a head per se, or a tail for that matter, but it is, uh... Well, in Lovecraft's own words, in lieu of a tail, there depended a kind of trunk or feeler with purple annular markings and with many evidences of being an underdeveloped mouth or throat. So it's not a head or even a full face, but there is a suggestion of a mouth at the end of Wilbur's tail, or caudal appendage. 
One element of fiction which I love as both a reader and a writer is taking the defining traits and features of traditional monsters and using them in creative new ways to make something which is novel and unique while still being in some ways familiar and recognizable. For example, vampires drink blood. Werewolves are a combination of a man and a wolf. Gorgons have a mane of serpents and can kill you at a glance, and a chimera is a mix-and-match combination of multiple beasts. Scholar and novelist Will Murray has pointed out that Wilbur seems to be a Lovecraftian take on that last example, with his part goat, part reptilian features, and even a not-quite mouth at the end of his not-exactly tail. This cover art by Rowena Morrill has leaned into that serpent tail imagery particularly hard, and the theory is supported by the epigraph from Charles Lamb's Witches and Other Night Fears, which mentions chimeras by name. Wilbur may also be a sort of autobiographical caricature of Lovecraft himself, from his stigma of perceived ugliness to being raised in his grandfather's private library due to an insane mother and an absentee father, but I digress. The Greek poet Nicander of Colophon provided his own description of the Amphisbina, but based on it, he seems to have been describing real-life Amphisbinia, a clade of legless squamates related to snakes and lizards, characterized by long bodies, the reduction or loss of limbs, and rudimentary eyes. The example on your screen now is called the white-bellied worm lizard, or Amphisbina alba, belonging to the genus Amphisbina of the family Amphisbinidae, which feels a bit redundant. The Asian cylindrophus, or pipe snake, and the Australian shingleback skink are other squamates with tails that resemble their heads in order to confuse predators, but neither of them are venomous like the mythical Amphisbina. And now, if you'll permit me a brief diversion into how fascinating, do tell. How can you differentiate a snake from a lizard? If you said legs, you're wrong. There's an entire taxon of squamates known as legless lizards, and despite what some internet smartasses might say, they're not just snakes. Meanwhile, primitive families of snakes such as boas and pythons have pairs of a kind of leg or claw-like appendage known as pelvic spurs. These are the semi-vestigial remains of their femurs, and being bones with an outer covering of keratin, which are found at the terminus of limbs, they are also technically claws, at least according to some definitions. This means that if you really want to mess with someone, you can truthfully tell them that snakes have short tails and claws. The pelvic spurs are believed to serve a purpose only in mating, because they're larger on males, akin to male platypus's venomous ankle barbs. Hmm, it's ironic. Between a snake and a mammal, you'd expect the reptile to be the venomous one. Oh well. There's also the occasional mutant snake that grows a leg due to atavism, a biological phenomenon in which ancestral traits suddenly reassert themselves. Basically, forget about the legs. The real way to tell a snake from a lizard is eyelids. Snakes don't have them. Instead, they have a special modified scale called a brittle over each eye. I bet you didn't even know lizards have eyelids, and admittedly, not all of them do. Geckos are probably the most well-known example not to, and so they must make do by licking their eyes instead. Chameleon eyelids have actually fused together, leaving just a little pinhole for the pupil. Legless lizards also have ears, obvious holes on the sides of their heads, as well as lateral grooves in some species, which allow for expansion of the body when feeding, breathing, or gravid. A good example can be seen here, on the Sheltopusic or European glass snake, which is actually a legless lizard. Its binomial designation is Pseudopus apotus, meaning fake legs, no legs. This animal is a slow worm, but despite its name, it's not a worm, and despite its appearance, it's not a snake either. It's another legless lizard, as you can tell by those peepers. The other way to spot the difference is to look at their tummy scales. Of course, not every multi-headed serpent is an amphisbina, but most of them take the slightly more biologically plausible approach of putting all the heads at the same end. Examples include Greek mythology's Lernia and Hydra, Yamato no Orochi of Japanese legend, and the Yuan-Ti anathemas from modern fiction. That latter group should not be confused with the Yuan-Ti abominations, as in fact I did when typing up the first draft of last month's script. Their names may be practically synonyms, but that's where the similarities end. The anathemas have bodies like giant serpents, with a pair of humanoid arms and six snake-like heads. In-universe, they're worshipped as divine incarnations of Mershalk, but they're often confused with hydras by players for quite understandable reasons. As we discussed last month, the Hydra's father, Typhon, also had many serpent heads, possibly as arms. The idea is as fantastic as it is fictitious, but if you want to see a snake-armed person in real life, then look no further than British swimmer and model Jojo Cranfield. At this point, we're straying from the stated topic of serpentine tales, so I'll call the video to a close here. Before I do, however, I would like to take a hard swerve into flag-shaming for a hot minute. This is the bisexual pride flag, and this is the unicorn variant from Jane B. Shea, although I prefer this modification which moves the unicorn to the hoist and removes that unsightly trademark. The flag was created to combat bisexual erasure, and its designer decided to use the unicorn as a symbol because unicorn is also a euphemism used within the swinger community for a bisexual person. 
Specifically, it refers to a woman, or occasionally a man, who is willing to have casual sex with an established couple. Although all so-called unicorns are by definition bisexual, or pan, poly, multi, etc., most bisexuals are not unicorns, nor do we want to be. To that end, I have created a new bisexual pride flag with a different mythical beast, the Amphisbina. I picked it because its elongated serpentine body makes a good central stripe, one which isn't straight, and because its name literally means I go both ways. Now we can fly our flag with an Amphisbina representing bisnexuality. Sorry, that was awful. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video up until those terrible puns, because that's all I've got. Thanks for watching, and have a nice day. In Lovecraft's own words, in lieu of a tail, there depended a kind of trunk or feeler with purple annular markings and with many evidences of being an underdeveloped mouth or th Damn it, Minxie.